Hello, hello, how are you going? Oh, you sound all right, I think it could sound better. That is more like it. My name's Bernie Hobbs and I start today's session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which this festival is being presented. I also pay respects to Australia's First Nations, who we recognise as first scientists and custodians of the lands and environments and all the inanimate and animate things within it. We acknowledge the importance their legacy passed from one generation to the next for over 50,000 years has on caring for Mother Earth and contemporary scientific conversations. And I acknowledge the deep and timeless relationship between country and Aboriginal peoples and Torres Strait Islanders and also pay respect to the elders of the community both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, who are with us today. And do you know who I also pay respect to? You guys, because what have you done? You've come out for World Science Festival Brisbane 21. All right, how's that? You're the ones who deserve a round of applause because I don't know about you, but I am sick and tired of online learning, of Zoom classrooms, of seeing people on screens. Do you know what you're going to see today? Science, real life science done by real life scientists. We have got some absolutely gun research chemists out there. So you've all heard of chemistry. Do you know what the best bits of chemistry are? Explosions. All right, who wants to see an explosion today? All right, just add an explosion to the list. So yep, we'll have an explosion. What else do you want to see today? Santa Claus, I can't guarantee Santa Claus. Science, yeah. Okay, we are going to have, does, does anyone like, does anyone like shiny pretty things? Yeah. Oh yeah, we'll have some of that. Does anyone like bright colors? Yeah. Does anyone like it when things go completely the wrong way and make a big mess? Yeah. Okay. We have so got the show for you. Now, I want you to give a great big welcome to our research scientists who are the superstars of this afternoon. They are all chemistry researchers. They're all chemists working at QUT just across the river. So first up, we have got, and I've gotten so excited, I've forgotten their names, even though they're my new besties. Uh, so our first research scientist is Dr. Nathan Boris. Come on out, Nathan. <laughs> Now, obviously, Nathan is a scientist because, look, he's an old man with white hair wearing a lab coat. So, obviously, that's a scientist for you. Now, Nathan's going to go start sciencing straight away, but I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the work he does. So, you know, have you ever been sick and had to take some medicine? Yeah. yeah. No, you've never been sick. There's a superhero in the front row here. Um, well, most of us have had to take some medicine because we've been sick. Sometimes if you're really sick, really sick, sometimes you might have to take medicine for cancer, you might have to take really serious medicine in hospital. Nathan's doing research to make those medicines for cancer better, to make them so they don't make you so sick, they're easier to take and they work a bit better. So what do we think of Nathan's research? Oh, up go Nathan. Yeah, so um, that's not what he's doing right now. That's something different, but that's what he does for his day job. So that's give it up for Nathan Bose. All right. Now, our next researcher is Dr. Charlotte Petit. Dr. Charlotte, do you have any guess where Charlotte might be from? Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Charlotte Petit is from France, but she speaks the English quite beautifully. So, uh, sorry about that bad impersonation. No now, <laughs> now Charlotte is also very obviously a scientist, because look at her, look at all that grey hair and white lab coat. She's obviously a scientist. This is what scientists look like. So give Charlotte a big hand. Thank you. Now, Hi, everyone. Now, Nathan's working on medicines for cancer. Sharla's working on something else. I don't know, has anyone ever had to go to the dentist? How much do we love going to the dentist? So much. Has, has anyone ever heard the dentist say these words? I'm going to have to drill. <laughs> they are not the funnest words to hear in a dental surgery. Well, I tell you what, Charlotte is working on research 
that might mean dentists don't have to say that anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Charlotte's trying to make a kind of feeling that instead of when it's finished with, instead of having to use a drill to break it down, yuck, you just shine a very particular light on it and it falls into pieces and then you just spit it in the cup and everybody's happy. How great is chemistry and Charlotte? <laughs> All right, we've got one more superstar chemist for you. Can you please come right out right now, Michael Frunder? Woo! Mm -hmm. Michael's shy, he's walking along the back of the room there. So, you know, be very gentle and very kind with him. So see how everyone's got a desk here? Well, well first of all, I should tell you what Michael does. So have, has anyone ever seen a crystal? Yeah? So what are crystals like? Shiny. Oh, they can be dangerous. Are they, are they squishy? No. They're hard. Are they round and smooth? Yeah, they, they can be like rocks, they can be like coloured rocks. Sometimes they can be, um, I suppose, round and smooth. But usually, you can hit them with a hammer and they smash, right? That's, that's pretty bad news, but that's usually what happens with crystals. All right, Michael discovered a crystal that not only doesn't smash when you hit it with a hammer, it can bend. Michael, I know, it is ridiculous, <laughs> it is insane, but Michael discovered the first bendy crystal, and since then, I have to say, my nephew's girlfriend found a crystal that can get tied in a knot. I mean, what is going on? I know, <laughs> gymnastics, crystal gymnastics, that's what's going on with chemistry these days. I'm not sure, it's not going to make anyone feel better from chemistry when they're sick. It's not going to make anyone's feelings hurt any less. But how great is crystal gymnastics? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, I think we're about ready to get going. All right. That's enough from me. My name's Bernie Hobbs. I'm a science nerd, geek, uh, and total fan from the ABC, or used to be. Uh, and um, I'm going to hand over right now and leave you with Dr. Nathan, Dr. Charlotte, and Dr. Michael. Have fun. I'm going to come down and join you there. And let's have a great show. Over to you, Dr. Michael. Hi, everyone. How are we going? Yeah. Who's excited to be here today? Yeah. Are they excited enough? I Who's know. excited to be here today? <laughs> there we go. I'm Dr. Nathan. I'm Dr. Charlotte. And I'm Dr. Michael. And we're here today from QUT, just across the river over there. Um, and we're all chemists every day. And we're here to show you just a little bit of the magic of chemistry. So I want you to be very patient, but to keep your eyes on this flask. <laughs> so that's pretty amazing, right? What does it look like? <laughs> does it look a bit magic? Does it look a bit magic? Yeah. Yes? Well, one of my favorite things about being a chemist is that I can make magic happen, as you're seeing here. But what we're hoping to show you today, that chemistry is quite amazing and quite magical, but we can use it to understand the world around us. If we look around us, everything we can see, everything we can touch, everything we can smell, everything we can taste, all of that can be explained by chemistry, okay? And that's what we're hoping to show you a little bit today. Now, we need to start and think about what is everything that we can see and touch made of? Does anyone know what everything is made of? Atoms! Oh, wow. Excellent. So if we can bring up my slide for atoms, we can actually have a look at what an atom looks like. All right? So over there on uh, your left, is what often people get shown is an atom looks like. You've got like a, a, a nucleus, which is made up of the green and, and purple balls. The green balls are our protons, they have a positive charge. The purple balls are neutrons, they don't have any charge at all. And then flying around the outside, you often see electrons, and they're drawn as little planets orbiting um, the sun 
which is our nucleus. Now, who's seen this kind of picture before? Yeah? Big Bang Theory logo and stuff, right? This is nothing like what an atom is. An atom's not a planet. <laughs> it doesn't have stars flying around it. Electrons and atoms are much, much, much weirder than planets flying around the sun. Electrons are so strange that we sometimes, or sorry, we can never really know exactly where they are or how they're moving. So instead of saying where electrons are, we try and describe where we're going to find an electron. And this is actually more accurate of what an atom looks like over here. Each of those big yellow fluffy clouds represents one area where we're likely to find some electrons. Now, the beauty of this is that electrons can do weird things, and so therefore we can do chemistry with those electrons. Now, each of those big yellow clouds we call electron shells. Okay? And each of those shells, depending on their size or their shape, have a certain amount of energy associated with those electrons. How do we know this? How do we know there's energy associated? Well, Dr. Charlotte's going to show you an experiment. So, as Nathan said, every atom is different. They all have their own number of neutrons, protons, and electrons. And as chemists, we like to know what kind of atoms are in our <laughs> substance. So what we do, usually, is to just burn it. Should we do it? <laughs> yes, we should. I'm going to burn this container here. So I have in front of me these three dishes. And in, there, in the first one is some kappa, the next one has some lithium in it, and the next one has some potassium. Can you already see some color? Can you? Yes, you can. I'm sure you can. <laughs> it's pretty cool. So, we can see here that the copper turns a bit blue-green. The one in the middle looks more like a purple. Kind of, it's supposed to be red, though. It's a bit funny. I don't know what happened there. Uh, and potassium is supposed to be purplish, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so what is happening here? The thing is, when we heat up the atoms, we give them energy. The energy is used by the electron to jump from one shell level to the next one. But the electrons cannot stay up there. They have to come down. And they do so by releasing all the energy in the form of light. This is what you can see here. Energy and light are very, very closely related to each other. And the color of a flame can tell us how much energy was released. You all have seen fireworks, right? Do you like fireworks? We love fireworks. I love fireworks. That's absolutely awesome. What is, whatever is burning in the sky, are these exact chemicals. And the color you see here are the same you can see shining in the sky. But why do we keep talking about electrons and shells, Dr. Nathan? So let's do an experiment. Let's do an experiment in our minds. Right? We know now a little bit what an atom looks like, so if we can bring back our atom slide. <laughs> we can see that those sh um, electron shells around the outside are bigger than the nucleus. But how much bigger are they? So let's imagine we take one atom, we can't even see an atom, right? But we take one atom and we make it up much, much bigger, and we make the nucleus of the atom as big as this ball in my hand, this balloon, OK? Now, how big do you think the electrons are on the outside? Like this big? Bigger? What do you reckon? As big as this theater? Bigger? So the electron cloud would be the same size as the Brisbane city center. So the electrons would go from here all the way down to the Fortitude Valley, way down the back of the city. Wow, wow right? That's much, much bigger. So think about it. How much is going on in here? There's nobody inside here. There's no cars or anything like that. But there's lots of activity going on outside the city. So when we bring two atoms together, it's actually the electrons that, um, that react with each other and actually interact. And the nuclei are so small, they barely even um, notice. Okay. But we can do more than just pretty fancy colors with electrons. What else can we do with electrons, um, Dr. Michael? OK, so Dr. Nathan and Dr. Charlotte have been talking about positive protons and negative electrons. 
But we can't see these things with our eyes, can we? <laughs> Looks like Dr. Charlotte's having some Sorry, fun over there. Sorry, excuse me. Yeah, just you can have a look at <laughs> this. I'm just breaking glass. It's nice and pink now, Elise. It's awesome. Whoa. Look at that. And that's all on purpose, obviously. Lots of smoke. Steam, all probably. All right, all good. All yeah, good. give a round of applause for you. Dr. Charlotte. Thank you. Sorry for that. That's okay. So. Dr. Nathan and Dr. Charles have been talking about positive protons and negative electrons, but we can't see these things with our eyes. They're far too small. How can we really know that they're there? A microscope? A microscope's not powerful enough to see that small. You need a huge super microscope to be able to see individual atoms. A big super microscope. That's a good point. There are these things called electron microscopes that can actually see right down to the atoms. But you or me, just in our classrooms or even at home, how can we, without these the giant microscopes, how can we see the, the atoms? Buttons? Well, a magnifying glass, again, wrong direction. Definitely not going to work. We need something much more powerful. We can do an experiment that can actually show us, with our eyes, um, the positive and negative of electrons. So, have you, if you've all played with magnets, have you guys played with magnets before? A few people, yeah, yeah, okay, so you know they stick together, right? Each magnet actually has a north pole and a south pole. You might have learned that in school. If you put the two north poles together, the magnets actually push away from each other. They don't stick. And if you put the two south poles together, they actually push away from each other as well. It's only when you put the north and the south together, they actually stick together. And guess what? Protons and electrons, being positive and negative, are just like the north and south pole of a magnet. So, if you guys would like to demonstrate, if we stick to, if the protons are like the positives and the negatives are like the electrons, if we stick the two positive protons together, what do you guys think going to happen? They'll stick together or push each other away? <laughs> yes, that's right. Okay. So, the two negatives, the two, if we stick two electrons next to each other, what do they want to do? Push away as well. That's right. It's only when we put a proton and electron next to each other, guess what's going to happen, guys? They attract each other, look at that. They will stick together, they, they attract each other, positive and negative, they will attract each other. So, there's an experiment you can do in your very own home that allows you actually to see this with your, with your eyes, and it actually works with real protons <coughs> and real electrons, okay? So you might have done it before, but if you have a balloon and you rub it on your hair, okay? Do you want to do it on your... Oh, on my hair? Sorry. No, 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 I've, I've done my hair very carefully for All today. Right. I didn't want to ruin my hair. I, I don't think we should try Nathan's hair. I don't know when he washed it last. We don't want to make the okay, balloon too dirty. I get it. I think you're the, the best should I just candidate for this it? one. Yeah, go for it. Can you see Dr. Charlotte's hair sticking straight up? Look at that. And she got her hair done yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a true story. So, Can you see it? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, you can see it great. You don't know yet. No, I can't see anything. <laughs> the, so the hair is actually stuck to the balloon almost like glue, okay? So what's happening, really what's happening here is electrons are travelling from the hair to the balloon. And then the balloon has too many electrons. So the balloon actually becomes like a negatively charged thing. It's a whole big negative charge. And the hair lost all those electrons. All those electrons are gone. So it's actually becoming positively charged. So just like those two big cardboard things, the hair's like the positive with too many protons, and the balloon's like the, electron with too, the, like the electrons, the negative, with too many electrons. So they stick together. This is called static electricity. If you've ever zapped yourself on the car door, it's the same kind of thing. And in fact, lightning in storms forms in just the same way, just in a much bigger way. In clouds, there's actually positive parts and negative parts. Negative parts, positive parts. <laughs> And when those negatives and positives connect together, that's when we have a lightning bolt gets released. So it's a very, very powerful thing. So now we've talked about positives and negatives. Dr. Nathan, could you please tell us a little bit about how that actually applies or what that means for us in the real world? So we've been talking about atoms and what atoms look like. But it's very, very rare that you will ever meet an atom by itself. Generally what happens is multiple atoms get together and they make chemical bonds, and they form what we call, uh, call a molecule. So something made up of multiple atoms. Now, this is really interesting for three reasons. One, we can change the number of atoms that are bonded together. We can change the types of atoms that are bonded together. Or we can just change the way that they are connected. 
By doing this, we can completely change the properties of the molecule. We can make them shiny, we can make them hard, we can make them soft, we can make them liquids, we can make them gases, just by changing the way the atoms are connected. And that's what we're going to show you today. We're going to show you the different ways that atoms make molecules, and we're going to look at different types of chemical bonds. And Dr. Charlotte is going to show you the first type of chemical bond. Thank you. So just like the hair and the balloon, the balloon was able to actually get electrons from a hair, the thing is, atoms are also able to do it. They are able to steal electrons. How charged would be an atom that stole one electron? What do you think? Positive or negative? Positive. It would be positive if it gets one more electron that is negatively charged. It would get negative. An atom that is able to lose one electron, it would have one less negative charge, it would become positively charged. Does that make sense? I guess it does, doesn't it? Hopefully. So when um, we have a special word for these kind of atoms able to lose charges or gain charges, we call them ions. Have you heard about ions before? Yeah? No. The thing is, ions, <laughs> just like uh, with the magnets shown before, when you put a positive atom with a negative atom, they tend to be attracted to each other. And they can form a complete new chemicals that we call ionic chemicals, and the bond between them is named ionic bond. Should we do an experiment? Yes. Let's do it. So I have here in front of me two solutions. Can you see? They just look like water, don't they? Just water. Just water. The difference here is that, is someone making fun of my accent? <laughs> Hopefully not. This is, in this water solution, we have some positive ions named lead ions, and in this one, we have some negative one named iodide ions. I'm going to pour first this one in this empty flask, and then let's have a closer look at what is happening when I put this one in. Are you ready? Should I keep going? Yeah. Should I pull it all? <laughs> okay, let's do it. How beautiful is that? It's gold. Did I just make gold? I think I just made gold. That's awesome. So you may not see it quite well yet, but actually we have solid in there. So there's solid suspended in the, in, the, in the water. So with ionic bonds, you can get from perfectly clear solutions, liquid, and make them solid. Should we have a look at other type of um, ionic chemicals we can make? Let's go. We have some positive ions on one side, negative ions on the other side. Let's put it all together. I reckon my golden was nicer. <laughs> so, ionic chemicals, yeah, don't show off, mine was more beautiful. <laughs> okay, ionic chemicals are pretty awesome. You can find them in many, many uh, places at home, uh, but also they are more beautiful when you find them in caves, <coughs> just like this one. This is a big, beautiful crystal um, that is an ionic chemical. But also, did you know that you also put crystal and ionic chemicals on your dinner? Who is... Hey, wow. That you know everything already. What am I doing here? <laughs> because yes, table salt, just like this one. This is an ionic chemical. It is made of sodium, that is positively charged, and chloride, that is negatively charged. Um, is that all I want to say here? I guess so. No, what I want to show you first, and that's actually the nicer part of it, I did this same experiment here with the lead and the iodide. I did it a few weeks ago, and look at how the golden sparkles became. 
So this, this is not gold. I know it looks like it, and I wish it was gold, to be honest. <laughs> but it's not. This is lead iodide. This is a complete new chemical made from lead ions and iodide ions. And the floor is yours, Michael. Okay. Wow. That's cool. I wish that was gold, too, because then we could all retire. Or maybe, maybe not, but <laughs> at least we'd have a little bit more money. <laughs> so, anyway. Ionic bonding, okay? It makes crystals kind of stuff. But if we look around, the whole world isn't made out of crystals, is it? I mean, unfortunately. There's lots of other kinds of things around the place, and that means that there probably must be some other kind of bonding that we make these other kinds of things. For example, if we flick over to the next one, you can see these beautiful gold bars in the corner here. They're made of metal. They aren't like crystals, are they? If you hit a gold bar with a hammer, it doesn't smash into lots of pieces, does it? They're very strong. And they mustn't be crystals. And I'll tell you what, the reason why they behave differently is because they have a different kind of bonding. Not ionic bonding, where we had... They don't have positive ions and negative ions that are attracted to each other, like when Dr. Charlotte was showing us that stuff. In this case, all of the atoms are actually neutral. The difference is... Their electrons are buzzing around like busy bees inside the metal, jumping from atom to atom all the time. And this actually makes all the atoms stick together and make the metal, okay? It's a bit like fairy bread. Has anyone ever had fairy bread before? <laughs> yeah, you have? Oh, that's good. I love fairy bread. It's actually my favorite thing to eat at kids' parties. So you have bread, and then you put butter on it, and then sprinkles on top. Now, these are like metallic bonding because the sprinkles are kind of like the atoms, and the butter is kind of like all of the electrons that are bouncing around, holding all of those sprinkles or atoms together, you see? And it's these electrons jumping all over the place that actually makes metals really good for conducting electricity because of the, ele the way the electrons move inside. So we use metals in cables to charge up your devices, phones, computers, because it can, the, electrons can, or the electricity can flow through those metals very easily. It's also for why they're so shiny as well. <clears throat> So, um, Nathan, Dr. Nathan, if you've got this, uh, this flask for me here. Here, I have a flask with metal in it, right? Does it look like metal? What, you don't believe me? You're calling me a liar? What? Oh. Oh, <laughs> of course, yes. Okay, so I, I sort of lied, didn't I? But not really, because there is metal in here, but it's metal ions. There's silver in here. Silver ions is currently positively charged. And I remember I said when metallic bonding happens, all of the atoms are neutral, not positive. So to make something go from positive to neutral, can anyone tell me what we would have to add in? Yell it out. Elect electrons, negative particles, electrons, and then it will become neutral. So that stuff I poured in, that I forgot to put in, that stuff is actually the electron food for the silver ions so they can become neutral. It was actually a solution of glucose, which is a sugar, kind of like what's in lollies, and it's actually the, the molecule that all of your bodies use to make energy. Silver actually really likes stealing the electrons from the glucose, and when it does that, it becomes neutral. And once it's neutral, it has all of the right ingredients for metallic bonding. So it should then stop looking like a clear solution and then, if this works, it should start looking more like a gold bar because that's what metals are. They're very shiny. So if I just keep swelling this now, I apologize, it's a little slow because the glucose doesn't really like it when um, silver steals its electrons, so it takes a little bit of time. But once the reaction is finished, hopefully, we will have... I told you there was metal in there. <laughs> a beautiful, shiny metal inside the flask. Hello. Can you see me in there? <laughs> so it looks like now we have metal in there. So we had the electrons go from the glucose to the silver, and it is, the silver has now coated all inside that flask, and you can see yourself in there. It's like a mirror, like a silver mirror. Pretty cool, right? <laughs> okay, so there we go. So, as a scientist, it's our job to be creative and ask questions, okay? So, 
we, we're not satisfied with just making some metal. We want to know, okay, fine, we added electrons to the silver and it turned into metal. Can we take electrons away from the metal and make it go back the other way? Let's do it. Let's give it a try. So I have here some metal that I brought from home. My wife's going to be very mad when she finds out all the alfoil and the salt's gone. But um, <laughs> See, this is alfoil, right? It's from, um, you guys might have done cooking with it or your parents might have done cooking with it. It's made out of metal and has metallic bonding. Look how shiny it is. And it's very strong for how thick it is, right? So we're going to try and use a chemical to steal electrons away from the alfoil and turn it back into, and um, take into positive ions, which will be in the solution and turn into ionic, and turn into an ion. So to do that, here's, here's some alfoil in a flask I'm going to use. And I have this other solution, which is hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid is what you put in your pool when you want to go for a swim, right? Yeah, it's also what, it actually eats metal when it comes in contact with metal. So that sounds a little bit scary, but remember, when we put it in our pool, it gets diluted. It gets mixed with thousands of litres of water. And so it's not dangerous for us anymore. It's only dangerous for us when it's very concentrated. So, the, it's actually the hydrogen from the hydrochloric acid that steals the electrons. And when it does this, it goes from being hydrogen in hydrochloric acid to hydrogen gas. So if we do this reaction, if I pour this stuff in here and we see hydrogen gas coming off, we'll know that the electrons are getting moved around and that the metallic bonding will be getting destroyed because the electrons will be going to the hydrogen. But there's one problem. I can see one problem with this. And that problem is that I can't see it. Hydrogen gas is invisible for our eyes, so we won't be able to see the hydrogen gas. But there's something about hydrogen that will make it so that we can see it very, very clearly. Should I pour it in? Yeah. All right. OK, here we go. OK, so we can bring the lights down. We can keep going down. Yeah, let's go. All the way down. All the way down, 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 down. OK, here we go. Ooh. It's coming, it's coming. It's coming, the gas is forming now. <laughs> hey? So cool. Oh. Oh. <laughs> cool, right? It's almost like it's dancing in there, right? That's so cool. So, oh, sure. okay. what do you think? It's the fact that hydrogen gas is flammable. We, we set it on fire, and then we can see the fire. If we zoom right in, you might be able to see bubbles. Can you see? Yeah, you can see lots of bubbles forming. Guess what that is? Can anyone yell out what do you think the bubbles are from? Yeah. It's, I think I heard someone say gas. Gas. It's the hydrogen gas being formed in the chemical reaction. And as it's formed, it comes straight up, and then it's on fire. And that's what's fuel fueling this fire. It's actually still burning. It's hard to see, but the lights are on, but it's actually still on fire. And you might even be able to see uh, some red stuff being formed. Yeah, you can see it on the screen. So that's actually this, the aluminium has lost its electrons, given it to hydrogen. We've got the fire. And then the silver has now become positively charged and now has formed ionic bonds with something else in solution and gone red. So it's, the full, it's, it's now moved on to the next cycle. Um, a little quiz for you guys. I wonder if anyone can tell me how I made the fire green. That's a tricky one. You might not be able to think of it now, but think of it. Can anyone yell out the answer to your thing? What have I done? <laughs> I think I actually heard someone. Did someone yell out copper? I heard that. I thought it was you guys. Well, I heard a few people. I definitely heard someone say it early over here. It's I put some copper in there, just like Dr. Charlotte did earlier. So that's how we had the green fire. But anyway, so that's that reaction. <clears throat> now, so yep, sorry. we've talked about ionic. We've talked about crystals. We've talked about metals. But of course, our world isn't just made of crystals and metals, is it? There's other things too. So there must be some more to the story. So Dr. Nathan is actually an expert on another kind of chemical bonding 
that leads to lots of other things. Can you tell us more? So we've learned about two types of bonding. First of all, we had the selfish ionic bonding, where one atom steals an electron from the other atom to form the bonds. Then we heard about the very, very sharing, very, very um, everybody plays nicely together metallic bonding that share their <laughs> electrons everywhere equally, right? The last type of bonding is called covalent bonding. And this is where two atoms come together and they share their electrons equally. So if we have a look up the top, I've got some balls and some sticks, and these represent a chemical reaction between hydrogen gas that we just saw with Dr. Michael and an oxygen atom, which is the big yellow ball, and then it makes another molecule over here, H2O, two hydrogens, one oxygen, and that molecule is water. Now see how I've got balls and sticks on the screen? Do we think that atoms look like balls? Do we think there's really tiny little sticks holding atoms together? <laughs> no, that's right. So what's holding our atoms together? It's our electrons again. Remember our electron shells? So if we have a look at the bottom, we're looking at different electron shells. So we've got the blue electron shells of the hydrogen atoms and the yellow electron shells of our oxygen atom. And in our water molecule, can you notice the two electron shells that are now green? That's because the hydrogen and the oxygen are sharing their electrons evenly. Now, the electrons aren't actually um, blue and yellow and green. I just colored them just to show you which ones are being shared. Okay? But this is how we do covalent bonding. And this is actually most molecules you see will be covalent molecules. Now, we've all seen water before, right? We've all drunk water before. Water's boring. <laughs> But can we see? Yep. Can we see how far we can push covalent bonding? Ooh, that looks nice. So have a look at my flask. I've got a nice purple solution on the bottom, and a sort of clear solution on top. It's a little bit uh, white, but I've just got two solutions. But let's have a look at what happens if I reach into my flask. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. How cool is that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's coming right out. Yeah, it's like goo. Who here likes to go fishing? Who likes to get dressed up and play um, dress-ups? Yeah. So this chemical is called nylon. So nylon is the same... Whoop! <laughs> this is the same thing that fishing line is made of. And it's also the same thing that a lot of costumes are made from, like plastic costumes. Now this is what we call a polymer. Poly means many, and mer means molecules. We've got lots and lots of molecules connected together via covalent bonding. And you can see that, because I could just keep pulling and pulling and pulling. There was no end to how many bonds I could put together. Now, nylon's really good, because covalent bonds are really strong. And that's why my nylon fiber is pretty strong and hard to break. <laughs> now, if you've ever gone fishing, and you've reeled in a really big fish, right, the nylon string, or the nylon fishing line, actually doesn't break, right? So that's why we like to use covalent bonding, because it's really strong and makes strong molecules. Now, I'm a big fan of polymers. I make them in the lab. Polymers are also called plastic, so anything plastic is made of a polymer. And there's lots of different types of polymers. And I think Dr. Charlotte has another cool one to show you. That's right. So as Nathan just said, when you put together many, many, many molecules, and then you attach them with a covalent bond, you form what we call a polymer. So you can think of a polymer just like a chain of paper clips. <coughs> so this is how it looks. You put one molecule after each other, and then you have a covalent bond between each of these paper clips, molecules. So the polymer I'm going to play with today is what we call an alginate. So it is red just because I added food coloring. Actually, it's usually transparent. So you can see it's a liquid, just here. And alginate are pretty cool. You can find them, they are derived from what we call algae. And you can find this exact same polymer at the bottom of your bubble tea, for example. 
who has ever had, who has ever, I'm French, then again, who has ever had pearls at the bottom of their bubble tea? Do you know the ones that pops in your mouth? This was it. This was alginate. Should, should I make some pearls? Yeah. Should we do it? Can you see what I'm doing? Here. Should I make them bigger? Yes. Can give them funny shapes and we can even make some worms out of it. That's pretty cool. So, what is happening here? From two liquid, I can make one solid floating in a liquid. So what is happening is, my polymers, you can see it on the slide in one second, <laughs> Now, the polymers are like these orange strings, and this is the alginate. And then in there, I have some calcium ions, and the ions are able to tie together two polymer chains, and this makes them um, even bigger and solid on the outside. And if we go back to this paper clip, this is how it looks like, actually. It's like having <coughs> chains of paper clips tied up together. It's a mesh. So you can imagine this mesh in three dimensions. That's it. That's a gel. You're actually eating gels in your bubble teas. That's <laughs> yuck. No, that's not junk. That's great. <laughs> um, should I go crazy? I have all these syringes here. Can you see them? Oh. Should I just pour them all in there? Yeah, let's do it. Ready? Three? Here we are. So glad you got that LG. But Dr. Nathan, that's not all we have to say about covalent bond, is it? So at the start, I said we can change molecules by changing the types of atoms that we bond together the number, or even just the way they're connected. So the next type of bonding we're going to talk about is still sorry, covalent bonding, but we can look at molecules that are just made of one type of atom, or one type of element. Here I've got a little red vial, a vial with red powder, and this is phosphorus. It's a special type of phosphorus. We call it red phosphorus because scientists, we aren't very good at naming things. <laughs> so the phosphorus is red, and you can see it's pretty safe, right? It's in the vial, I'm holding it, I'm not too worried about the red phosphorus. But let's see if we can do something a little bit more fun with this. So can we bring the Don't lights down, please? Don't you want to put on pure sunglasses first? Oh, yeah, that's right. I think you need sunglasses for this, Nathan. So this is a very cool experiment, so I have to put my cool sunglasses on. He's showing off. <laughs> So all I'm doing is heating a glass rod in a flame. What does it look like? The sun. A light bulb? A bulb came in A flashbang. Somebody's been playing too much COD. <laughs> so I call this my red phosphorus sun. Now, I showed you the red phosphorus before. It was pretty safe and it wasn't catching fire. So what happened? What did I do differently? So if I can bring out a slide back up. What I did was put a spoonful of red phosphorus in there, and then I pressed a hot glass rod against the red phosphorus. And by heating the red phosphorus a little bit, I've changed it from the red phosphorus, see where it says red up there? See how it's a zigzaggy type molecule? So they're, all the red balls are phosphorus atoms, so they're connected via a zigzaggy pattern. And I converted it to white phosphorus, see that up the top? It's like a pyramid. 
Now, when we take atoms of the same, of just one type of atom, and connect them in different ways, we call these allotropes. Now, that white allotrope is very dangerous, and it lights on fire spontaneously, like straight away, just catches fire in air. And that's what we're burning here. It's actually white phosphorus that's burning. Now, we can also see there's different types of allotropes of phosphorus, and they all have different colors. Okay? But you've probably all done or seen this chemical reaction before. Who's ever seen a matchstick? What color is a matchstick head? Red. red. Right? The matchstick heads are made of red phosphorus. So you know that your matchbook is very safe. Your box of matches, it doesn't just spontaneously catch on fire. But as soon as an adult takes the match out and rubs it along the side of the box, they're applying a little bit of heat to that red phosphorus. And you convert just some of the red phosphorus into white phosphorus. And then it catches fire. And then as some of the red phosphorus catches fire and heats up the other red phosphorus, it all converts into white phosphorus, and you have your match lit. <clears throat> so that is the power of covalent bonding. Now, when you see fire, you see energy. That's lots of energy that's coming out. And that's because we're breaking chemical bonds. Now, Dr. Michael is going to show you what else we can do when we take the energy of broken covalent bonds. <laughs> cool, right? Burning stuff's fun, isn't it? setting on fire, exploding stuff. It's so much fun. That's really what made me want to be a scientist when I was a young kid like you guys. So I grew up, and I really knew I wanted to be chemists because they're the ones who get to go in the lab and sit sci-fi to stuff like this all the time. It's a lot of fun, right? Have you ever thought about uh, where there's all this heat and light that comes off these fires? Have you ever thought about where the energy, because we know energy, heat and light are energy, have you ever thought about where all that energy comes from? From space? <laughs> that matter. Well, hey, that's a better guess. I've got, a, I've got a clue, I've got a clue, I've got a clue. When you go and turn, when you want some light at home, you just turn on the light switch, right? Electricity. Oh, so Nathan, did you plug your, did you just put an electric cable into that and turn the light on and that's what made it go? Oh, that's how no, made no it. Cables? I'll show you, no plugs. What? Where's the electricity coming from? It's not electricity. What have we been learning about? What are the kinds of things that join atoms together? Bonding. Bonds. The chemical bonding between the atoms, the covalent bonds that we've been talking about, they hold lots of energy inside of them. And so if we do a chemical reaction that breaks those bonds, all of a sudden you see the results fire, heat, light, the energy is released as heat and light, these kinds of things. If, you, if, you, if the fuel goes in your car, that fuel is actually a molecule with lots of covalent bonds, and those covalent bonds have lots of energy. And inside the engine, it burns them, and that gives the, ener the, the energy from those covalent bonds goes to the engine, and then that drives the wheels, and your car goes forward, so your car actually gets driven by the energy inside covalent bonds, that tiny. If you lie down on the couch and watch, put YouTube on the TV and watch some... Whatever you guys watch these days, I don't even know. Well, I sort of do. I've got two kids, but... <laughs> that gets driven by electricity, right? That electricity probably comes from a power plant where they burn coal to generate the electricity, right? And that electricity travels all the way through the lines, through the metal, all the way to your house, and the TV comes on. So next time you're watching TV, next time you're watching Netflix or something, maybe have, take a little moment to thank covalent bonding for all the energy that's being used to make your TV work. Okay? So, being chemists, we try to be clever sometimes, <laughs> and we're actually able to do chemical reactions in certain ways that make only sp special colours of light come out. So, let's see what happens if we mix all of these chemicals together, okay? If we can get the lights down as I pour these in, one, two, three, go. Lights right down, down to zero. Get those lights down. Pretty cool, right? 
Oh, it's all gone. That's pretty cool. That didn't happen before. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> so we can, as in science, we get to do all these really cool things, right? So these beautiful colors are like, kind of like the colors that come out of your TV screens and your phones and things like that. It's all come from, all those lights that come out of those things and your devices come from molecules and the bonding. And it's all because of scientists, not me, better scientists than me, worked out how to make those molecules shoot that light out with electricity. Okay? In this particular chemical reaction we've done here, it's very much like, have you guys played with glow sticks before? You put them all around your arms and stuff and swing. Yeah. You broke it. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a bit of a mess when you break it, right? And chemicals. Well, the reaction inside the glow sticks is very similar to what's going on here. When the chemical reaction is going, it's breaking bonds and light is coming out. Have you ever put them in the freezer? Yes. It's really cool. What happens? Does the, do they keep? What happens if you put them in the freezer? You save it, that's right, because when the, when the chemicals get really cold in the freezer, they stop moving around so much, right? Cold atoms and molecules don't move around as much, and the chemical reaction slows right down. And we know the chemical reaction is what gives the light. So in the freezer, they actually stop glowing. And the weird thing is, as you guys pointed out, the next day or even the next week, if you pull them out of the freezer, the light comes, still comes out again once they warm up. It's because that chemical reaction gets warmer again and starts going again and producing the light again. It's like our bodies. Yeah, if we get cryogenically frozen, we probably wouldn't be moving very much. If you, if you jump in the freezer. Anyway, so my point is here that heating up all those chemicals as they come out of the freezer makes that reaction speed right up. So heat is a one way you can make a chemical reaction speed up. But there is another way, and Dr. Charlotte is going to show us. Absolutely. And for the next experiment, we need a chemical named hydrogen peroxide. Have you heard of this before? Yes, right? So we use it as an antiseptic sometimes to clean cuts and wounds, and what it does is killing bacteria. So hydrogen peroxide is a liquid. It is made of hydrogen atoms and oxygen atoms. Its chemical formula is H2O2. So it has one more oxygen atom than water. What is happening right here? I is that think, big enough, Dr. Charlotte? I think we need it bigger. Bigger? bigger? How big? I'm not really sure what is happening, and I think we need it even bigger than that, guys. Bigger? bigger. Oh, gosh. Do we need raincoats for the students? Are you Maybe right? Not. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're good? That is really big. All right. Let's see. Let's see what is going to happen. I'm getting a bit worried right now. This is gonna be Who said this? So, I was talking to you about hydrogen. Nothing is happening yet here. I'm the one you should look at. Look at me. <laughs> so hydrogen peroxide, it has a covalent bond in the middle that can break, and it breaks very, very slowly, usually. There's one way to make it break even Pasta is to use a catalyst. So the hydrogen peroxide can break into dioxygen, O2, and water, H2O. Should we do it? Yes. Safety first. Thanks for the reminder, Dr. Nathan. <laughs> OK, how much do we like this carpet? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we don't care, do we? <laughs> All right. I put it in there, and then I explain to you what just happened. <laughs> yeah. That was good. <laughs> <sighs> ah, I like my job. Write that down. That's right. That's the elephant toothpaste. <laughs> Have you seen it live already, like this? You've seen it better? Yeah. Ah, bigger. <laughs> okay. Well. <laughs> Do we want it bigger? Yeah. <laughs> Why, did you... Why did you do that? I'm not sure this would be possible. I think we love this carpet way too much for this. <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you want to know what happened? Are you remotely interested in this now? Okay, we want to know what happened. 
So I broke the H2O2 and I formed dioxygen. So is dioxygen more of a solid, a liquid or a gas? What do you think? It's a gas. You already know everything. That's a gas. So usually when you form a gas, it would just leave. You wouldn't, wouldn't even see it. In this case, what we did, we added some detergent in it. So the gas got stuck into bubbles and formed all this foam. So as you know already, this experiment is named the elephant toothpaste. For pretty obvious reason. <laughs> and that's it. How much did we like it? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Dr. Charlotte. So we've learned about a lot of different types of chemical bonding today, haven't we? Different types, of, um, different types of bonds. So let's go back all the way to the start. Do we remember our reaction from the start? What, what's going to happen? So the solution starts clear, then it goes to yellow, and then it goes to the blue-black, right? So what's happening? So let's talk about that clear solution to start with, right? That clear solution is a solution that contains iodide ions. All right? There's our black. So the clear solution, which will come up in a moment, that one there, that's mostly iodide ions. And you first met iodide ions with Dr. Charlotte during her precipitations. So these are negatively charged iodine atoms that are floating around in solution. We're doing a chemical reaction with hydrogen peroxide, which we just saw in the uh, elephant toothpaste. The hydrogen peroxide reacts with the iodide ions and makes them form a covalent bond, two iodine atoms connected together, called iodine. This is a very similar structure to the oxygen molecules we made in the elephant toothpaste. Now, that iodine is yellow. That's that yellowy colored solution there. Who's ever had a cut and their mums put some antiseptic on their cuts? Yeah, what color is the antiseptic? Yellow. That's because it contains iodine. Now, that's what we have are two chemical reactions going on inside our flask. One converts the iodide to iodine, and another chemical reaction that breaks the iodine and turns it back into iodide. So it's forwards and backwards. Now, when we have just the right number of iodide and just the right number of iodine atoms, it goes purple because we've put a polymer in there. We've put some starch. Now, we saw with the alginate, if we connected the alginate with calcium, it formed ionic bonds and made a gel. The ionic bonds between iodine and starch make the really dark purple color. Now, something about ionic bonds is that they're very weak, and so they can just break apart, and we lose our purple color, and we get back the clear solution of just iodide ions. And then the whole process can start again and go over and over and over and over. So hopefully, you've learned a little bit today about how molecules are made, how different types of bonding can change the properties of molecules. And I hope the next time you're looking at some fireworks or looking at a shiny piece of metal, you start to think a little bit about the chemistry that's going on. Please join me in thanking Dr. Charlotte, Dr. Michael. I've Dr. been Dr. Nathan. Nathan. You've all been scientists today. Thank you very much. Oh, I reckon we can do a bit better than that. How great was this chemistry today? <laughs> All right, go forth and be great scientists and have a great weekend and fire and explosions and colour and mistakes. They're all good in the right place. It was so great to have you here. Enjoy the rest of the World Science Festival and say goodbye to Nathan and Michael and Charles. Thanks for coming. We'll Thanks see for coming. you next time. Be safe. See ya.